uh, first I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, so, uh, as Lisa said, uh, today I will be talking about uh, what we can learn about atmospheric dynamics, uh, especially in the upper exoplanet atmospheres, and as a result of, the, uh, as a result of that, uh, what we can learn about atmospheric escape by um, looking at transit, observing transits of exoplanets in one particular line of helium uh, around one micron. Um, so, uh, J oh, a little bit messed up, okay. Um, uh, James gave a beautiful uh, overview of this entire topic and he saved me a lot of work, so basically I can skip my entire introduction. Uh, so he introduced hydrodynamic escape in close and exoplanets. I'll just quickly reiterate, these highly radiated planets uh, planets uh, absorb a lot of high energy radiation, their atmospheres get heated up, and as a result, they have these radial outflows uh, that can be very efficient at removing gas from planets. And this can have important consequences for the demographics of uh, exoplanets that we observe. Uh, so this uh, sub-Jupiter desert and this uh, radius valley. Uh, so one way to uh, create these features is through atmospheric escape. But also, as James pointed out, there are a lot of things we don't understand yet about atmospheric escape, and a lot of that is because we uh, can uh, have not observed it in action uh, until now in, in large samples of exoplanets. So things like how does exactly mass flow rate depend on various properties of the planet and its host star, so mass, radius, incident flux at different wavelengths, uh, age, spectral type, so on. What is that heating efficiency? Uh, maybe we can uh, empirically derive it and uh, see how it compares to our th theoretical expectations. Then how important are other non-thermal mechanisms uh, of atmospheric escapes? And then, of course, the, what role do magnetic fields or stellar winds play in this entire um, picture? So basically, I think that one really good way to start answering all these questions is by observing atmospheric escape in action as it happens. Uh, and to do that, the best place to look are these uppermost layers of planetary atmosphere. So we're talking about really, really far out, uh, somewhere around few planetary radii um, uh, re regions. So basically around the Roche ro radius of the planet or even maybe beyond. Uh, and these are really, really low density environments. So in order to observe these regions in transit, you have to look at very specific wavelengths. Uh, so perform transition spectroscopy at uh, wavelengths such as Lyman alpha, as uh, also James mentioned and showed this figure already. So this has been done um, basically in the last 15 years since this papers in 2003, 2004. Uh, Lyman alpha transits have been observed in exactly four planets in these 15 years. And this just tells you how difficult these measurements are um, because stars are most exoplanet hosting stars are intrinsically bright, uh, intrinsically very faint at, at these wavelengths, and uh, we lose a lot of also information in the central part of the Lyman alpha due to the ISM absorption. So um, we've seen this picture before from Aaron Reich et al. 2015. It's the Lyman alpha flux of uh, GJ436. Uh, in black is out of transit, and in red is in transit. And even just by eye, we see this enormous drop in flux due to this highly extended cloud of hydrogen that's surrounding uh, GJ436b. Uh, so these observations have been great because they were first evidence uh, of uh, the fact that this hydrogen envelopes can extend very, very far out from the planet, uh, where this gas is clearly no longer bound to the planet. So this is direct evidence of atmospheric escape. But uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of observational challenges with observing Lyman alpha. Uh, and um, some, some of it is that we actually cannot observe the center of the line where a lot of really interesting information is contained. Because basically in Lyman alpha, we mostly see just this high velocity, um, high velocity tail of the distribution. So we see particles very far out from the planet that have been accelerated to large velocities, but we don't really see what goes on closer to the planet where these winds and outflows are actually generated and where a lot of interesting physics uh, goes on that we would like to understand better. So um, this is that main challenge with Lyman alpha. And so um, we could start thinking, so, okay, what are, the other what are some other lines that we could use 
to uh, make these observations and learn more about upper exoplanet atmospheres and atmospheric escape. So uh, there are a few requirements that we would like our line uh, to uh, satisfy. So first of all, one necessary criterion is it needs to be sensitive to low density gas because we really want to know what goes on very far out from the planet. Um, but at the same time, we don't want a line that's also very sensitive to ISM absorption. So we want something that is very sensitive to low density gas, but not uh, so much that it gets basically eaten away by uh, ISM on its way towards us. Uh, and another requirement, it would be really nice if it was observable from the ground, unlike uh, Lyman Alpha, which can only be observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, basically now, um, because then we have many more uh, telescopes available to us and we can observe much uh, larger samples of planets and learn a lot more. And it turns out there is at least one line, and hopefully more of them, that satisfies all of these conditions. And that is the helium line at uh, 1083 nanometers. So actually, the origin of this line is really, really interesting from just the atomic physics point of view. So uh, it comes from the fact that uh, helium atoms can exist in two configurations based on the relative orientation of spin of its two electrons. So if the spins are anti-parallel, we're talking about the singlet configuration. If they're parallel, uh, we have a triplet configuration. And these two configurations basically um, live independently of each other because they're not radiatively, uh, they're radiatively decoupled. They're still collisionally, um, an atom can transition between a singlet and triplet, but radiative transitions are suppressed. Um, which means that the lowest lying state of the triplet helium, which is shown here, is, uh, which is radiatively decoupled from the ground state, has an extremely long lifetime and is metastable. And if you basically look, think of triplet helium, you can almost think of it as a separate species, and this would be its kind of ground state. So so-called ground state of triplet helium. And because it's so high up, it's basically 20 electron volts higher than the ground state, all these transitions happen in either visible or near infrared, which is really convenient uh, for observing them from the ground, whereas transitions from the actual ground state of helium are all the way in the extreme UV. Um, and the, basically the strongest transition originating from this metastable uh, state is this one, and it has the wavelength of 1083 nanometers. And this line has been well known and studied in astronomy, in uh, in studies of the sun, of stars and stellar winds, in the studies of AGN outflows. And it has even been suggested as a good probe of exoplanet atmospheres in 2000 by Seeger and Sasilov. Uh, but um, until recently, there has not been a lot of work done on it. Uh, so when I started working on this topic, basically the only paper that I could find in the literature that discusses uh, actual, uh, that talks about an attempt to observe this line was this paper from 2003 that reported a non-detection. And um, after that, it's almost as if the line has been forgotten um, until recently. So basically what I was interested in is trying to see uh, how much absorption in this line can we expect from these uppermost layers of exoplanet atmosphere, so the thermosphere and exosphere. And it's important to keep in mind that the conditions in these parts are very, very different than uh, conditions in lower regions of atmosphere, which most people think about when they talk about exoplanet atmosphere. So in thermospheres, we talk about really low densities and temperatures of like thousands, even 10,000 degrees. And this, because of its so low density, uh, the population of atomic levels is not in local hydrodynamic equilibrium. So you basically need to do a non-LT radiative transfer to actually compute the population level of that metastable helium. Um, so basically I decided to do that. And first I assumed a simple atmospheric uh, model based on isothermal Parker wind, which is a model that was developed back in the 50s to describe solar wind. But uh, now we believe it's actually a really good approximation for these planetary outflows. So basically, the density profile looks like this. It starts off uh, fairly similar to a hydrostatic atmosphere, but then it drops off faster. And uh, the velo it has, it's not a static atmosphere. It has a radial uh, velocity, which uh, starts off at very small values close to the planet, and then at sonic point transitions uh, and becomes uh, supersonic. 
Uh, and so uh, in, in that kind of environment, I'll cal I'll, I calculated the expected uh, population level of the metastable uh, triple helium and found that uh, we can expect to see uh, these kinds of uh, absorption signals. So even though I keep calling it the helium line, it's actually a triplet of line, which gives us this very characteristic shape. So it has three lines of, these are the wavelengths. So two components uh, are very, very close together and they blend in this red component or main component. And the third line is further out into the blue. So it, it has this char very characteristic double, double peak profile. Um, so basically, as I was finishing uh, this purely theoretical work, completely independently, uh, Jessica Spake, who was, who's here actually, and he, uh, she was at that time a PhD student at the University of Exeter, was looking at the Hubble Space Telescope data of uh, WASP-107b, and she noticed that there's this really strong peak in transit depth around one micron. And uh, she realized that this could be uh, due to the, this helium line. Um, unfortunately, due to the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, WC3, um, the line is not resolved. So basically this entire band test is something like 100 angstrom, whereas if you look at this line profile, the line is maybe one or two angstrom wide. Uh, so basically in, this, uh, in Hubble, uh, Hubble data, we cannot resolve the line, but we can still detect that there's something uh, strongly absorbing in this entire band path. And I would just like to quickly uh, mention that uh, Megan Mansfield also observed uh, helium, excess helium absorption in HAT P11 in another Hubble uh, data set. Uh, so because in the, in the Hubble data, the line is unresolved, we cannot really tell much uh, beyond just the equivalent width of the line, and we cannot say something about how this gas is dis distributed. So this is another plot from uh, Jessica's paper that shows uh, how we use two different models to try to model the signal. So one is the model that I described, uh, Parker wind, that's fairly spherically symmetric, and it produces this double-shaped profile. And another model is uh, by uh, Vincent Bourrier uh, that is quite different geometry, so it has this elongated tail of material and produces um, a fail in the absorption feature. Uh, and with the Hubble data alone, we cannot distinguish between do, these two geometries. But luckily, uh, the helium line can be observed from the ground uh, with many uh, high resolution spectrographs. And this is not a complete list. And I apologize if I did not include your favorite spectrograph. Uh, but this is just to show that there are many out there. And we can use basically all of them to uh, look at a transit. And this uh, has been done uh, since last year for so, and helium line has been detected at high spectral resolution in uh, several planets. And this is a beautiful work done all with the uh, Carmena spectrograph in Spain. And uh, so I would just quickly like to go through a few very really interesting examples. So this is uh, WASP 69B, uh, and uh, this is work by Lisa Nortman, and we see her poster, I think, today. Um, so this is a really interesting, um, an interesting case because it has, it produces about three and a half, almost four percent transient depth, transient depth at the center of the helium line. Um, the line, um, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, bec uh, the line ratio between the main component and the weak component can tell us a lot about the optical depth of the medium. And in this line, it's interesting because it points to an optically thin atmosphere, which we will see later is not always the case, but in WASP-69 it is. And it's the only one of the planets observed so far that shows evidence of a delayed egress compared to egress. So the, in most other cases, the light curve looks fairly symmetric, but WASP-69 seems to have a tail of helium that it takes about 20 minutes longer to egress than it is when it's uh, in egress. So it's quite unusual in that sense. And it's really interesting. Um, another interesting example, HD 189733b, uh, well-known uh, hot Jupiter. Uh, it has a smaller uh, transit depth of maybe goes up to about 1% uh, in the line center. But this planet has a really unusual line ratio. Uh, the, line, the ratio between the main component and the weak component is something, uh, I think, about 3 to 1. 
or which points to a medium of optical depth around three. So it's actually really a, a dense, uh, the signal goes through a dense medium and optically thick medium, which is quite uh, interesting and different from WASP-69B, for example. And uh, so I hope you all got a chance on Monday to see posters by Gloria and Antoine, uh, who uh, presented detections of helium in this planet with two, uh, two different spectrographs on two different telescopes. So this is, uh, this is now really being done with multiple telescopes around the world. Um, and uh, to go back to WASP-107b, which was that first detection by Jessica, uh, it has been observed from the ground by Allard et al., uh, published just earlier this year, and it still shows the, high, the, uh, the highest transit depth, depth of all the planets, so basically it reaches up to almost like 7 or 8 percent in the line center, so which is quite extraordinary. Um, so... Uh, we observed also the same planet with Keck, with uh, the NERSPEC spectrograph on the Keck telescope. So this is work done with Jessica and uh, Lynn Hillenbrand from Caltech. And this is still work in progress, but I just wanted to show our, what I think beautiful spectra is. So here in black, you see uh, out of transit spectrum of uh, WASP 107. And then in red is the in transit spectrum, which even by eye, you just see um, this uh, increase in absorption. Uh, so when we look at uh, just the average in transit spectrum, this is what we get. Uh, so uh, we have slightly lower res spectral resolution than the Carmenis, so we don't, uh, our line is not as deep because it's kind of smeared out, uh, but we get something like 5% um, transit depth at the line center, which if we assume is due to just an opaque like annulus, it will correspond to equivalent radius of about two planetary radii. So that's how far out we see uh, helium, at least. Uh, and the transit depths are consistent with uh, Spake et al. Hubble detection and Allard et al. Carmenis detection, uh, which were, and this, so they were taken within like a year and a half apart, which corresponds to something like 100 orbital periods. And this tells us that this signal is repeatable and stable for at least that many orbital periods. And again, we see a quite interesting line ratio of four. So the, the main component is four times uh, stronger than the weak component. And I'll remind you, in the optically thin medium, we'd expect it to be eight times uh, deeper. Uh, and so this tells us that in WASP-107, um, this corresponds to optical depth of about two. Uh, so, uh, and then if we, uh, I think this is the, probably the most interesting part of these observations, is instead of just looking at the average in transit absorption spectrum, if we try to break out um, spectra into time series and kind of group together all our uh, spectra that were at the, in the first maybe quarter of a transit, uh, then this shows the central part of the transit, central middle, and this is the last part of the transit, including egress. Uh, we see uh, quite significant shifts in the line. So the line starts, uh, first it's redshifted corresponding uh, with respect to the rest frame wavelength, then during the mid-transit, it's kind of right in the rest frame, and then in, in the later part of the transit, the line is blue-shifted. Uh, and this has actually been seen before in, uh, or similar, has seen before in WASP-69 and HD-189 uh, with almost similar uh, shifts. Uh, and this is telling us something really interesting about the dynamics of these upper layers of planetary atmospheres. And it's also telling us that our simple models uh, based on spherically symmetric Parker wind are just not enough uh, and not sufficient to explain these data. Uh, so basically here I just demonstrate how if I take just my spherically symmetric Parker wind that just has a, uh, an outflow, but it's all just the same in all directions. And it kind of, you can reproduce, you can find a model that fits the mid-transit kind of fairly well. But if you try to use that same model to reproduce the earlier phases, so kind of ingress and egress, uh, you fail. Uh, so it's basically telling us that we need to make our model 
it's more complicated and add additional physics and learn the data is already rich enough to tell us more about the system than just what the simplest models are capable to tell us, which is great. Um, so, and we're trying to, uh, that, that's what we're going to try to do next. Uh, so uh, add more parameters to our models. So maybe things like uh, winds. So wh when I talk about winds, things. Uh, so radial outflows, I call outflows, and anything that's horizontal, I call winds. Um, and so maybe if we, oops, if we add that kind of horizontal motion, we can reproduce these strong blue shifts. Or if we make uh, atmospheric profiles different on the day side versus nighttime, which is not unrealistic to expect, I think we might have a better fit to the data. Uh, but in order to start adding more and more parameters, we first needed to make uh, our radiating transfer code much faster. And this was the work that was uh, done by my uh, RE student this summer, Caleb Carrada. He's an undergrad from uh, Maryland, and he did really an outstanding job at making the code faster and more efficient. And so now we think we can really start adding more parameters and try to match the entire uh, time series of spectra instead of just uh, the average in transit spectrum and see what we can learn about the additional physics of, and dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, but even if that uh, proves not to be enough, we can always look for more complicated and complex structures. So uh, there has been a lot of work done on uh, trying to model uh, planetary winds and stellar winds and how they might interact and what kind of uh, geometries they might form. So in, uh, in this work in 2015 and also uh, John McCann's work from earlier this year. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that he has a poster about this. So basically the material that escapes the planet might form a leading uh, arm that kind of goes to the star and causes this redshift. And then a trailing uh, arm that is kind of blown away by a stellar wind and can cause these blue shifts perhaps. So this is work that I'm currently uh, doing with uh, Morgan McLeod, who's an Einstein fellow at the CFA. So we're trying to create these 3D hydrodynamic simulations of planetary outflows. Uh, for the moment, we're just putting them in basically by hand and trying to see what happens to their geometry and dynamics. And we're uh, yet not trying to launch them really self-consistently, but that is something that we'll uh, try to do in the future. Uh, but yeah, this is one way that we can try to get at these shifts by basically doing uh, ray tracing through this material and see what kind of shifts we get. Um, so kind of to wrap up this uh, part, uh, so we can look for evidence of atmospheric escape if we observe these extended atmospheres of exoplanets. So even though technically we're not probing the gas that's outside of the Roche radius, so it's not like Lyman Alpha where you actually see this tail of material that has already escaped. Uh, in helium, we're probably probing these regions inside the Roche radius. But if we can study dynamics uh, of this material uh, to sufficient detail and find evidence that there are these radial outflows, then basically that tells us that this gas has to go somewhere. So it has to escape at some point. And I think the best way to move forward is to try to combine not just observations in the helium line, but other lines that might be probing slightly different regions of the wind, like uh, H alpha or the sodium doublet line, and kind of use the information from all these lines to create a full picture uh, of these planetary outflows. And this is uh, um, some work uh, that's been shown on Monday at posters by Julia and Aurelian, and I hope you got a chance to see them. They've been looking at sodium and H alpha, and they basically also see evidence of these outflows. Uh, all right, so people often ask me, where should we look uh, for these planets? So uh, here, this plot shows basically the strength of the helium feature uh, as a function of extreme UV flux of the host star. And it's really interesting to see that all the detections shown in blue uh, are here, and these are non-detections, uh, and also some non-detections that are not on the plot. So there seems, there, it seems that uh, whether or not we see uh, helium in a planet might be related to how much XUV flux we see from the star. But I think it's also really interesting to look at the spectral type, uh, types of these host stars. So all of these uh, planets that have uh, strongest signals orbit around K-type stars, uh, whereas these non-detections are around A, M, and this is G and M as well. So maybe this could t be telling us something about how, how helium is excited and um, uh, how uh, 
how the, the strength of the signal depends on the properties of the host star. So uh, in this plot, I basically show uh, most of the processes that are involved in populating and depopulating the metastable helium level. And for the sake of this talk, you can ignore all of them except this pink and purple line, which shows that the pink line uh, is the main populating mechanism, which is just photonization of the ground state and then recombination. And this is photons that live here. Uh, and you can depopulate the helium triplet through direct photonization from these photons which are here. And basically, I think the, one of the main um, uh, important key features to look in a stellar spectrum is the ratio of flux in this band and this band, because this will tell us how the uh, helium levels are populated. And basically, by analyzing that, we see that K stars seem to be more, most favorable, uh, um, more favorable than other types. Uh, so basically just proving the same point. If we increase the X-ray flux, we increase the helium population level. And if we uh, decrease this mid UV flux, we can uh, again increase helium. So basically what does this tell us? It tells us that uh, the, whether or not we see a helium signal will not only depend on the properties of the planetary atmosphere, but also will depend on the properties of the host star. So we need to take that into account when we make any interpretations of uh, whether or not we've seen uh, helium in some planet or not. Uh, and also it's often, mis uh, I just want to point out that this doesn't mean that we absolutely cannot see helium around other stars than K, K stars. We can if the conditions are right. It's just that the conditions are most easily met around K stars. Uh, and I'll just skip this slide. It just shows that it's really important to have good models of XUV flux if we want to have reliable modeling. And uh, this is my summary. I'll just leave it up there because I'm out of time. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Antonio. So yeah, I see a question up there. Please state your name and affiliation, even if people know you. Some people in the galley might not. I recognize your voice. For this particular for this particular data set, you showed this this shift from from red to blue. Have you have you investigated how this would look like in the stellar frame, just to make sure that it's not some kind of star signal that we're seeing? Yeah, yeah. It's well, I have backup slides that I can maybe show you later because. Move to a Sorry. different presentation. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, we did. This is something we we're still checking, but I think we did test. And for example, if you compare it to that strong silicon line, uh, that's right to the blue, uh, in the it just stays fixed, and you can see by even by eye in pixel when you plot pixels that the helium line kind of moves. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to show you later. Okay. I mean. I see uh, no, uh, Jane has a question. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, you now. <laughs> Thanks, Antonio. Um, the uh, result from GJ1214 um, was a non-detection. How much of that is affected by having clouds? Like, Do you expect that, that feature to be strongly muted as well? Or? Um, yeah, the GJ1214 is, is actually very, it was lower, low spectral resolution. So I think it's still not completely real that I would say. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, there has been some recent work uh, doing simulations, um, but I can't forget the, forget the authors now, but suggest that uh, actually helium should extend out, out beyond that. So it should, clouds should not be an issue for helium. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, 
Great talk, uh, Tad Kamasik, U Chicago. So when you were showing the winds, this is kind of following up on Bjorn's question. Uh, were you removing the planetary rotation when you quoted the wind speeds because they were quite fast? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Were you removing the planetary rotation for the? I included in modeling. So it's when I when I make my theoretical spectra, I include like tidally locked rotation. So yeah, it's included. The question came up if you uh, check if it's a stellar residual. Mm -hmm. Have you also looked into the Rosetta McLaughlin effect? Because it would be bigger for a very extended atmosphere. Uh, but um, I, we thought about it, but WASP 107 is a very, the star is a very slow rotator. It's like, I think Visa and I is like two and a half kilometers per second. And it's, uh, there's a paper by um, Diane Wynn that suggests that it's, uh, it has very high obliquity. So even on top of that small rotation, it's probably uh, transiting um, at high obliquity. So I don't think we can explain 10 kilometers per second shifts with, with Ruster McLaughlin. But. Okay, thank you. All right, let's uh, thank Antonia again.